Welcome, investigator. Evil is on the rise. Crime is escalating. Our mission is to eliminate the crime by exposing evil, examine why it manifests, and highlight the brave souls that confront it every day. Join us as we work together to bring justice to every victim. Welcome to All Things Crime. Here's your host, Jared Bradley. Hey, everybody, it's Jared. Welcome back to another episode of All Things Crime. We're close to the end of the year. It's uh, unbelievable that it's coming up to the end of 2022. I can't think of a better guest right now, especially because of everything that's happening in New York and around the country. But uh, retired homicide detective Scott Wagner is our guest today. And one of the things that I love about Scott is he can just shoot the bull with anybody. Scott, you're just amazing the way you just mix in all of these experiences that you had as a NYPD detective, along with everything that's going on. But, you know, I wanted to bring you on for a number of reasons to talk about what's going on in New York, but I know you also keep track of what's going on around the country. So I thought this would be a really interesting way to wrap up the year. So Scott, welcome back to the program, man. Well, thanks, Jared. It's a pleasure to be back with you. As always, best Holiday wishes to you and your family. Healthy and happy. You too, yeah. And Definitely need to tell everybody Merry you. Christmas. I appreciate you considering me for the end of the year. Oh. Yeah. Well, you know, it's an awesome end cap. So, in fact, I was going through some old episodes and some of the episodes that we, I think it was about a year and a half ago. Yeah, that, it was a while ago. That, that, yeah, they first had you on. But I was looking at some of that and, uh, man, we just have some great conversations, but you know, some of the things that we've talked about just even over the phone and last, you know, since we officially met, let's see, we met on LinkedIn about two years ago and then we've just kind of kept in touch ever since. And it's, it's been an absolute pleasure just to get to know you. And I know you're hanging out there with your grandkids today. So yeah, yeah. fantastic, man. They're both, they're both here with my wife and I, and that's a blessing for the holidays to have them here. My youngest son is 21. So He's past the stage of, you know, Christmas being all fun and games. He's actually working Christmas. So, the, you know, it's about the grandchildren now, you know? Yeah, so, absolutely. Okay. So just to get us started, let's talk about New York. So New York City, as we talked about the first time I had you on, is, you know, as New York goes, a lot of the country goes. That's correct. And... I, I find it so fascinating that the way New York has kind of cycled, you know, back in the 70s and 80s and even the first part of the 90s, there was a pretty serious crime issue there. I mean, it was, it was bad. I mean, I, how many murders a year did you have? Like, at we, the very worst? We peaked out, if memory serves, we peaked out in 92 with almost 2,700. And there was literally no end in sight. We looked like we were going to hit 3,000. That's how bad it was. When the Giuliani administration came in, it was a full court on crime. And my generation of cops and detectives and the generation that followed me, we knocked it down to, I guess, in, in the mid... In the mid to late 2000s, when, you know, I've talked about maybe 2010, down to 300 and change, which is unbelievable to do in 20 years, you know? And that was much all to the work of the New York City Police Department and with the district attorney, the various district attorney's office. We have five counties in New York City, five boroughs. So there are five district attorney offices. And they each, they were very zealous, as we were. And we prosecuted a lot of crimes. A lot of people went to jail. Unlike now, with the new bail reform laws that are in effect, the recidivism now is unbelievable. It's unbelievable. It's my oldest son is a police officer. And I hear the pains in his stories and the frustration that he's experiencing because they're arresting the same people over and over again for the same crime. And it's literally, you know, we always used to joke about a revolving door, but now it's literally these guys are out 
before the cops are finished with their paperwork. It's that fast, that quick. They're hitting this. They just arrested a serial burglar on the Upper East Side of Manhattan for breaking into Robert De Niro's townhouse. While he and his chosen were present, which is a scary thing, most burglars, they like to go in when no one's home. To go in when someone's home, it adds something to the burglary because you have the, uh, the expectation of violence. Because if you encounter the resident, they're going to be violent. Luckily, she was being followed by the cop. And they witnessed her go in, and they saw her through the window. She was in there, and they arrested her. But when it came out, she's got like 90 arrests, all for the same thing. And she had a warrant out for her at the time, which they just passed. There was legislation that was just done because a lawsuit was enacted about police detaining you to do a warrant check. It's crazy. Every time there's a stride, they knock it down. And it hampers the cops from doing their job. And the courts, the courts are a joke. Yeah. Well, I find it so interesting that it's actually getting bad enough that, and I saw that Robert De Niro story and I was like, well, you know, it'll, it'll, it'll take someone like that to get yeah. something changed. If you and I got burglarized while we were home, that nah, doesn't mean a thing. But Robert De Niro, that's another story. But we yeah, which in one. itself is the sheer fact that it, in by itself is just pathetic that, that it would ever get that way. But I find as crime expands and it starts affecting more and more people, the problem is as crime rises, the first group that it really affects are the marginalized anyway. Yeah. So the people that are in the poor neighborhoods, they're the ones that are suffering the worst initially. And then as criminals become more and more emboldened, you know, eventually it hits like the suburbs and the middle class. But now it's getting so bad that it's actually affecting people like Robert De Niro. Well, and it's again, in New York City, the worst crime happens, unfortunately, in area in neighborhoods where there are people of color. And we all know that when people of color are victims of crime, unless it's an unbelievable heinous crime or a child, an innocent child or an innocent elderly person, it doesn't make the media. The media doesn't pick up on it. And I, again, I've, I've experienced that in my career with a very frustrating homicides that I worked on, that they were victims were, or persons of color where normally those type of crimes, had they been white girls or white males, it would have been a task force of detectives. But because they were people of color and because of the location where it happened, it was just my partner and I. Now, we didn't work any less, but it just shows you that the New York State Police Department, I can't speak for other departments, I can only speak for the NYPD, can do marvelous things. When they're motivated correctly and the right pressure is put on them externally, the media or the public, they can move mountains. They can literally move mountains. And when they throw the manpower and resources into a case, I, I'd say 95% of murders can be solved if there's the right amount of manpower and resources. And in a lot of these cases, you're not getting that because of where it occurs in the city and who it occurs to. And that's, that's I've been championing, championing that for years where I've always said that everyone should get the same attention. It shouldn't be if, well, if you live in this section of New York City, you're not going to get the same attention as you would if you lived in another part of the city. It's wrong on so many levels. And now the NYPD, they have the ability, with the technology we have now, there's cameras everywhere. There's plate readers, spatial recognition, the DNA, the strides in DNA, the advances in DNA. You know this better than anyone. You are the DNA guy. The MVAC system is the strides that you've witnessed and you've seen from your own product is incredible. For the life of me, I don't know why the NYPD hasn't picked up on it. I think they really should. But that being said, I had one case in my entire career, and I, and I worked on well over 400 homicides, whether I was either the catching detective or what you would call the primary detective, or I was assisting. Only one, well, two, 
had video. One, the videotape was, it was decent. It actually helped solve the case. And that was a triple homicide, five people shot. So it could have been a quintuplet homicide, actually, just by the luck that two people survived. That was the uh, Carnegie Deli homicide in Midtown Manhattan in 01. That, we broke that based on a video. I watched a video. We never even realized there were cameras. So we found the camera. After the fact, we got the video. In those days, of VHS tapes. It was clear as a bell. And we saw the individual run, and he put his hand on the crown of the banister with the steps. We ran out. We were able to get a print off it and get him ID'd right away. The other case I had was... Hey, before you go into that other case, so this Carnegie Deli, mm-hmm. what happened? The guy just... People were in there just having lunch, and they went in... No, no, no. They started shooting. It was called the Carnegie Deli homicide because it was a, an apartment above the world-famous Carnegie Deli. See, that's another reason to show you what I said before about manpower resources. That was a homicide that took place in midtown Manhattan. My office was Manhattan North homicide. So we were called down to assist Manhattan South homicide in the case because it was, like I said, multiple people shot, three dead, five in total. And because of the press coverage that was garnered because of the location, it was a tenement building. Delhi was on the ground floor and it was a five-story walk-up. So there were two apartments to a floor above the Delhi. So it occurred there in one of the apartments. And it was the one of the victims. She was a dancer who uh, her claim to fame was she appeared in the movie Dirty Dancing. So that was her claim to fame. She wasn't, I mean, she was in the credits, but she wasn't a principal in the movie. But that was her claim to fame. Look, everyone has their, their little 15 minutes of fame. That was hers. But she was also a pretty prolific weed dealer. And she had a, an upscale clientele, basically, back in those days. And matter of fact, when we entered the apartment, there was a menu on the wall like you were in a diner, you know, <laughs> of the, the different strands and types of marijuana she sold. But it was a drug ripple. That's what it was. They thought she was much more prolific than she was, obviously. They didn't get anything near what they thought they were going to get. And uh, it turned out, again, we got this great print, this latent print, right off of the top of the banister. Because we could see in the video how the guy turned the staircase and he put his hand on the on top. So we ran out, secured the scene again, and our crime senior came out and they got lips. And again, to show you the resources of the department, we had a fingerprint tech standing by to process those prints as soon as they got there. So they were categorized and processed in an hour or so, where in normal cases you'd wait however long to get a print back. So again, how long did it take you to get a match? Because again, like I said, the resources of the department, we had a detective standing by exclusively to do this. Again, the pressure from the media and the pressure from the public. The deli did great behind that. They did more business than ever. But it was a front page case. And again, yeah. the videotape helped. Now, I had another case with video. A grocery store in Spanish Harlem, a terrible murder. The owner of the grocery, I knew him. He had owned the grocery store 35, 40 years. And I believe it was like in September, October of 97. And he was going to retire at Thanksgiving. So the grocery store only had milk, hampers, cigarette. That was it. He was going out, you know, he was retired for all those years. They came in to rob him, and they, he gave them everything they shot. And it was video. My partner and I looked at the video. I mean, I could talk about it now. It was so washed out that it was, it was of no value. So, again, you know, everyone had high hopes. But in those days, they used to use the same tapes over and over and over again. So the videotape, even if you knew who the perpetrator was, the video wouldn't have helped. So, yeah, that was the only time I had it. Now video is everywhere. They look for video. They go out, detectives, that's part of their investigative checklist is to go out and find video. Because you know it's going to be somewhere. You know? I mean, that's how times has changed. There's got to be more video cameras. I mean, between... These things, you know, that 
somebody has video of that, of whatever happened. You know, there's a lot of people in some of these other countries that, you know, they, it's almost like China. They do these surveillance state levels of video and stuff, but it's, it's not for people's security. It's for, they say that's what it is. Well, we just had a case in the private sector. Um, I believe it was Radio City Music Hall, which is owned by the Madison Square Garden Blonde, a woman who's an attorney. Only she, the story goes that she was escorting her daughter, who was part of a Girl Scout troop. I think they won because they sold a certain amount of cookies or whatever. So they won a trip to Radio City Music Hall, and uh, you can't get any more honest than that. You know, you're, you're escorting a Girl Scout troop for God's sake. And they did facial wreck on her. I guess their standard course of business, they do facial wreck on everybody that comes in. And they did facial wreck on her. And she was pinned out and told to leave. Because apparently the law firm she worked for in New Jersey was conducting litigation against the Master Square Garden Group for something unrelated. But she was barred because she was part of this law firm. So now it, it hit the media. So now it's becoming a big to-do because this is facial recognition in the private sector. And the New York City Police Department has been criticized for their facial recognition. But now you have a private conglomerate that's doing it. So you have to say to yourself, how many of these private sector groups are doing facial recognition and what are they doing with what they gone? You know, I mean, you don't know what they're connected well, to or they're not connected to. If it's a private group, you have the option of not doing business with them. Well, that's what happened. That's what the woman said. The woman, I think she's suing, you know? Then that'll be interesting to see, you know, because the, the question is, does Madison Square Garden have the right to bar whoever they want? You know, you see some of those in the in a restaurant or something, you know, we have the right to serve or not serve whoever we choose. And, you know, there's always that. If it's a private business, they should have that. And as long as people understand that they're in a public place and... But is it a uh, public place? You see, that's the whole thing. If you're in yeah. public, that's one thing. But you're in a private venue, even though the general public right. is allowed in. But where on your ticket does it say, you know, and these tickets you're are being surveilled? <laughs> that, you know, you could be thrown out for any reason. Now, imagine yourself... You bring your family to New York on a vacation, especially this time of year, because let's face it, New York City, Christmas time, it's one of the things we're known for here. And New York City is world known for their Christmas spectacular, their Christmas show, and the Rockettes and everything. So now you spend a nice piece of change to come here with your family, you get a hotel and, you know, all the accoutrements, and now you're going to bring your family during the Christmas show, and suddenly... Jared Bradley is told, you know, security guards, Brad, you said, sorry, you have to wait outside. You're the DNA guy. I mean, what happened? Your family's looking at you like, yeah. you know, my dad's a criminal. You know, think about it. it that, <laughs> that's not, it's not funny. Now they, sometimes they already think that. <laughs> yeah, I understand. I, it'll be interesting to see it, what the courts do because. This will be a landmark decision. This will affect things down the line. Do they have the right to refuse service to somebody? Based on, you know, not their actions, but just both kind of he was refused who they are. Based on her employer. Now, she's not one of the attorneys that's part of litigation. She just works for the firm. Now, that, you know, it's Lord like, knows how many attorneys work for the supposedly it's a large firm. Guilt by association is what that exactly, is. Exactly. Exactly. So now it can come down to, it can actually come down to a bias. And so if they want to take it to that level. She's a female. Mm. I don't know what her ethnicity is, but that always ends up coming out in some way, shape, yeah. or another. So again, I have a feeling this is going to be a landmark case. Thanks for joining us. Your attention today brings us one step closer to exposing and eliminating the evil that brings crime to our communities. Hit subscribe and share this episode. Together, we will bring justice to every victim.